glad you all decided to join us again today. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come once again to study your word, once again asking that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive your fresh. Father, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I am so happy that you joined us again today. We are on article number 11, The Perseverance of Saints. Now, author writes, We believe that such only are real believers as endure until the end, that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And so for the last few weeks or perhaps months, uh, we have ventured out from our main scripture of John 8 verses 31 and 32, which speaks of knowing the truth and being set free by that knowledge. We have put on uh, pause our discussion of some truths that consist of freedoms that we enjoy as being a part of the heavenly kingdom. And for a physical description of where we are, I call it the scenic route. Some may, uh, some of my most memorable memories of road trips are when we have gotten off the main road to check out some things that would have otherwise been missed had we not jumped off to explore. So the implication is that when you are in a, when you're not in a hurry, you can take the time necessary to have the greatest impact. That said, we are taking a fresh look at the love the Father has for not just those who have accepted him, but the love he has for the whole world. And if you missed any of the lessons, you can go back at any time and catch up at our YouTube channel, Mount Sinai, MBC of Memphis Incorporated. In fact, if you, uh, you can go through all the teachings that are there and just hang out with us for a while. You can even, as my grandson said, leave a comment right there and give a thumbs up. We left off last time at John, the third chapter, verse seven, which reads, you should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Verse eight, the wind blows where it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it, where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Then again, in verse 9, Nicodemus asks the question, how can these things be? And once again, it's important to remember who Nicodemus is. Uh, so just to fr uh, refresh our memory, he, we are told that he is a Pharisee, and the Pharisees in the Bible were members of a religious group that often, most times, clash with Jesus over his interpretation of the law. The Pharisees formed the largest and most influential religious and political party in the New Testament times. They are consistently shown to be opponents of Jesus and the early church. The name Pharisees means separated one. They separated themselves from society to study and teach the law. They also separated themselves from the common people because they considered the common people to be religiously unclean. The Pharisees were extremely accurate and detail-oriented in all matters pertaining to the law of Moses. They were more concerned about the outward form than they were about genuine faith. They taught that the way to God was by obeying the law. Thus, they gradually changed Judaism from a from a uh, religion of sacrifice to one of keeping the commandments or legalism. Jesus, in fact, called them hypocrites and compared them to a whitewashed tomb. You never want to be compared to a whitewashed tomb. 
uh, he said, which are beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are filled with dead men's bones. So not only was Nicodemus a Pharisee, but he was also a member of the Sanhedrin Council, which in our day would be like the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, and it would, but it was for the Jewish people. Uh, the Sanhedrin Council were the final authority on decisions that affected the religion and political life of all Jews. And then to top it off, uh, Nicodemus is rich. He came from an important aristocratic family in Jerusalem. And so Nicodemus didn't see Jesus as the Messiah, but rather a teacher divinely commissioned by God. And he came uh, wanting to hear more on his teachings. Uh, as a pious Jew and a rigid Pharisee, he had no doubt uh, he would be included in the kingdom of God. I would imagine that he came to Jesus to get the inside scoop on how it would all happen. Based on all that we know about him, can you imagine his astonishment to hear that being a son of Abraham, which he was, being a Jew, which he was, and being a Pharisee, which he was, was not enough? Can you imagine that he had, had all the things that he had accomplished uh, and, and yet that wasn't enough, that something more needful uh, something was more needful before he or anyone else could see or enter the kingdom of God. Can you imagine how life-shattering that would have been for a man of his status? He is left again, asking again in verse 9, the same old question, how can these things be? Nicodemus couldn't understand that the doctrine of regeneration was not about doing something, but rather of being and becoming. It, it wasn't uh, a, a new work to be done. If the truth be told, there are a lot of people, even teachers and preachers and good upstanding church folk, today, just as astonished as Nicodemus, thinking that their good works uh, their list of things that they do or don't do, uh, some kind of way is going to be on a scale. And, and, and if the good things outweigh the bad things, then that gets them into heaven. It, it's, it's hard to grasp that nothing we do will cause the new birth to happen. God causes it. And any good thing that we do is a result of it. New birth is not in our hands. Like the wind, it is not in our control. It comforts us, uh, it, it, it confronts us rather with our helplessness and our absolute dependence on someone outside of ourselves, namely God. All of this talk of, of drawing strength from, from inside yourself that's just self-help talk, and it will not cause us to be born again. We can't make ourselves to be born again. We can't do enough to be born again. New birth gives us a new life, not a re new religion. Nicodemus, like most people, already had plenty of religion, and, and yet he was spiritually dead. Just because Nicodemus recognized that Jesus was a teacher from God did not save him. Have you ever heard a, a, a sermon or a teaching and, and, and it was good to you and you are in total amazement? We may even say things like, surely God was in that person. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, seeing signs and wonders and being amazed at, 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 at the teaching and the preaching or the miracles of Jesus does not save us. You don't need a, uh, a new heart 
to be amazed at great teaching and preaching or even miracles. Your own nature can recognize God. The Bible says in Mark 1 and 24 that even unclean spirits, even the devil himself knows Jesus is the son of God. So you don't need a new heart to know that. Being born again is experiencing the supernatural in yourself, not just acknowledging it in somebody else. Just because you have a ooey gooey feeling when somebody is teaching or preaching does not mean that you are born again. God, the Holy Spirit, must come upon you and bring new life into existence. Regeneration is not a slight, insignificant change but a radical one, one which we cannot do for ourselves. I would imagine that Nicodemus saw himself barred forever from the kingdom by an impossible requirement. The reality is that God does not ask us the impossible. Instead, he provides the impossible. In the sixth chapter of John, before feeding the crowd of over 5,000 with two fish and five loaves, Jesus asked Philip uh, where they could buy, where they could uh, buy bread for all those folk to eat. The Bible says that he only did that to test him, for Jesus already knew what he had in mind to do. Jesus knew that new birth was impossible for Nicodemus or anyone else to accomplish on their own. Jesus said to Nicodemus in verse 10, you are Israel's teacher and do not understand these things? In this question, it is as though Jesus is kind of taunting and scolding Nicodemus at the same time. He says, you are Israel's teacher and yet, you don't understand these things? The question could be asked, what things? These things that lie at the very root of everything. These th things that cannot be gotten from the highest or by the highest degree a university can give. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you are a teacher. You are Israel's teacher. And do you and do you not understand these things? Jesus wouldn't scold Nicodemus about something that he had no way of knowing, which means that the knowledge was available and yet he didn't know it. Nicodemus was a teacher of the Old Testament and the doctrine of regeneration is clearly seen in the Old Testament. When you study the Old Testament, Two things, at least two things, stand out. The depravity of the heart of mankind and the loftiness of the moral requirement, which means that regeneration is a must. The, the requirements are so high that a deprived person cannot reach that high, cannot reach that kind of loftiness. Circumcision of the heart in the Old Testament is another expression of regeneration. Deuteronomy 10 and 16 says, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. God chose Israel because he loved them. And because of that love, he made a covenant to be their God and bless them. The seal, that, the, the, the seal of that covenant was circumcision given first to Abraham and commanded to be practiced on all his male descendants. The problem is that Israel held the physical ritual of circumcision to such a high esteem that they forgot the reality, the spiritual reality of it, that circumcision marked them as God's people with spiritual privileges and responsibilities. Circumcision wasn't a guaranteed entry into heaven unless there was a change in the heart done by God in response to faith. In Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, verse 6, 
Moses urges them to let God operate on their hearts and do a lasting spiritual work. And finally, uh, uh, another uh, uh, famous expression of circumcision of the heart or regeneration comes after David's fall in, in, in uh, Psalms 51 and 10. When David cried out to God, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. David knows that nothing less than a new heart will bring about the desired change. And he knows that it can only happen if God, through the Holy Spirit, makes it happen. Regeneration is, as a doctrine and a fact, is throughout the Old Testament. And yet, the religious leaders of Jesus' time had missed it. Thus, Jesus said to Nicodemus, you are a teacher, you are Israel's teacher, and do not understand these things? How can it be? In other words, how can it be? Well, loved ones, that's all I have for today. Uh, I hope that you have, have, have gotten something from this lesson. I hope that you will join us at another time. Until then, be blessed, and we will see you again next time. Thank you. Goodbye.